Welcome to the Daylight Talk with Anupama Kundu. My name is Angelika Fitz. I'm the director of the Architekturzentrum Wien, which is the Austrian Architecture Museum in Vienna. And I'm very honored to chair this session today with Anupama Kundu. Let me briefly introduce her. Anupama Kundu graduated from the University of Mumbai and later received her PhD from the TU Berlin. Since more than three decades, she has been following a research oriented practice. She, she runs offices in Germany and India. Anupama has taught at various international universities and was the Davenport Visiting Professor at Yale University in spring 2020. Currently, she is professor at the Potsdam School of Architecture. She received numerous awards, among them the RIBA Charles Jenks Award, the August Perret Prize, and the Building Sense Now Global Award of the German Sustainable Building Council in 2021, and the Global Award of Sustainable Architecture under UNESCO Patronage in 2022. Her rigorous research and experimentation is unique in the architecture world. And more important, it raises radical questions about basic assumptions and construction habits we have adopted during the long process of industrialization. She rethinks materiality through investing in human resources and human resourcefulness, such as time, skills, care and community. And through the concept of care, actually, our paths cro crossed for the first time. It was in 2019 when Elke Krasny and I invited one of her projects to our exhibition and publication, Critical Care, Architecture for a Broken Planet. Her lecture today is titled Rethinking Materiality, Human Resources and Natural Resources. Anupama, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to learn more about your brilliant work and to, our con and to have a conversation with you afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angelika. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to the Daylight team and Tina in particular. Uh, and I think uh, it's uh, the repetitive associations uh, with you that deeper and deeper layers of our work and the process behind also can get re revealed because often some of the works that we do in architecture, when you look at just the final product, you actually don't get to understand because sometimes good design or rethinking is in very small invisible details which are behind. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for joining and I'm looking forward to the discussion after the talk. So I'm happy to share with you the 33 years of my um, research intense practice through this title, Rethinking Materiality. And the reason for rethinking materiality is uh, very obvious. We know that even though architecture's utility lies in the part we didn't build, it's the void that humans occupy and it's the void's relationship with the larger space uh, through doors and windows that we connect to. Um, we know that architecture lies there, but post-industrial history has shown us that in the last hundred something years, we, our, our material habits have uh, resulted in grave consequences of our human impact on the planet which uh, includes social and economic and, of course, environmental concerns. And uh, in that light, materiality and rethinking materiality has become very important. So my research always began already by the t when I had graduated uh, from school, 1990. You know, it was already, we, we our generation had actually graduated in an environment where these concerns were already recognized. But my own journey in finding how to break free from the machine-made architecture, how to negotiate handmade with machine-made, high-tech with low-tech, and understanding the relationship of material, of 
the finite natural resources to the infinite human resources is the thing that I began to discover slowly through my own journey in architecture practice. So I would like to share the body of my work through summarizing that what I feel today. I think if you want to change materiality in architecture, we have not to focus on the material itself and not to polarize mud versus cement and concrete because each thing has its own utility. I think what we need to look at is whether we are using the human resource properly and if we are using or misusing or under utilizing a huge human potential in producing sensitive architecture that will be not only prob not problematic for uh, human society and for other pe um, organisms that inhabit the planet but also for the natural environment um, that is affected by that. So through the course of this talk we are going to understand um, how it is actually the proactive development of human resources that I am after and I think that optimizing that will automatically result in less natural resources. So if you take more time and more intelligence and more attention and more human engagement in, in production of anything from food to architecture or anything else that we use, I think it will automatically result in uh, controlling the throwaway culture and the mindless uh, expenditure of important resources. I began, I would like to just summarize with three images how, how much of a transition um, we have uh, seen in the before industrialization to after. So from a culture where architecture across the world was built with local materials where every, every culture has produced excellent work from stone, if there was stone around, if earth was the local material then we built with earth, if we have only ice you build with ice. Humans have lived everywhere and the human knowledge has been advanced through the way humans interacted with whatever they had around them in order to survive but not only survive to thrive and through the amount of time humans invested in architecture they cultivated the eye, they cultivate their hands and they brought finesse and culture like you see there can be in this area in Hampi you will find that rocks that you find lying around are used in a very simple way for ha habitat but it's used in a much more fine way for a temple or something iconic and that till today these structures can be adapted to have any other use because the structural stability is still relevant and these there are, there are so many um, there's so much architecture all over the world that has been built by our ancestors because actually architecture is known to outlive the inhabitants so it's very important that the other type to compare this with the post-industrial architecture where it's very much about a fashion a time period and in a very few years sometimes they are considering only 30 years as the life of a, a building just like we are doing for our gadgets and our computers and so on. It's good to take a little bit of a zoom out perspective on this matter to start with and this is a, an image that for me represents a situation this is of course Mumbai where I come from where I grew up and I have seen such a landscape unfolding in front of my eyes but I increasingly see this kind of a contrasting urban form developing everywhere even in the developed uh, countries in the cities and their peripheries you see that there is increasingly a, a man-made habitat being replaced by an industrially generated corporate style developer driven kind of a one size fits all kind of solution. That one size which is supposed to fit all does not fit all the budgets and they are not uh, it's not necessarily more economical. So you get habitat of a worse quality more uniform where we don't even recognize where our 
apartment is we are but this comes at such a high standard that way more of your salary would go into just meeting housing needs and so this is a question housing and affordability is a question that concerns everybody but also it's important to see the relationship to um, the habitat uh, the, the the loss of orientation to have housing that is not reflecting human scale and intimacy and these are also all very valid needs of human beings but also uh, the fact that the maker, the, the users are completely alienated from the technologies that are used to produce housing. Every bird and bee is uh, spiders, insects, they're all building their habitat and humans were also more involved in the habitat and as regulations come in, we start outsourcing to such a point that there is no scope even to uh, to do even 10% in your house and to reduce the costs or you know or 20% because you know now we have created a culture of large firms large um, uh, budgets and you know uh, we we award projects to people according to how much of a big budget we had have or how much have that company been able to uh, build and prove but the the small studios doing sensitive practice across the world are unable to sustain. So I am, I have been worried about the future of architecture if all these, these are the kind of large uh, consequences of the post-industrial um, building habits as I'm calling it. Habits because we are not consciously choosing them, maybe these are just, we just are getting habituated and feeling less and less in a position to contribute even though we are thinking, caring architects. So in the middle of this trend, there's, there's the other concern that all the uh, local building materials and local knowledge of how to handle climate to have buildings that can manage with daylight, they, that they require less energy to run, um, is also you know being outsourced to various uh, HVAC systems and retrofitted later or you have building facades with steel and glass which have the same design on all four sides regardless of which face is going to meet the sun so that 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 concern along with the loss of local knowledge of building with local materials whatever is around you in abundance to be able to spend that and not make the architecture expensive it is a, a real concern because now uh, reinforced uh, cement concrete for example is become the vernacular material across the world and in many countries um, steel aluminium glass and much more than concrete energy uh, mater high energy materials much with much more high embodied energy are being becoming the new vernacular material and I think everybody on the planet if you consider all the you know the high population countries like India and China which are together a third of the population and if all of South America and Africa we all will build like this it is a real it's going to show the impact is going to be much more than what we already have today so the loss of knowledge for example, you see in this image that you see bricks lying around and bricks are being used only as an infilling material in most countries. It's not even our own regulations are not letting us use those materials that timelessly have been used by our ancestors. So, so there are so many areas that when I talk about questioning assumptions and habits, I think these are all the, these are the three images which pose all the questions that show us that how we are building today um, is, is going to, if we are not going to dare to question some of these habits, it has very grave consequences when the whole world develops in this direction. So also the other point is the chase for efficiency, you know, we, we see in the industrialization, you know, post-industrial culture Everybody is trying to replace. I see each and every road being constantly replaced. When I live in Berlin, I see all kinds of facades have to be changed. Everything has to go better and we have to be more efficient, more efficient. Even our working phones have to be abandoned to buy new ones because they are more efficient. So I used to always ask myself, 
and I still ask myself, what is the point of doing efficiently things that need not be done at all? And I am asking this question, it's a really important question. Often we are not allowed to ask this question even in academia because everybody feels it, it's like the emperor's new clothes, we know it, but no one can dare to ask because it's an inconvenient question that is immediately silenced because we are all supposed to chase efficiency. This is also something worrying. And what is efficiency is being um, de de like uh, talking about the next upgrade, but not the consequence, the whole consequence of that upgrade. So I have the opinion that if you can, because I think that beyond all the computers that we are developing, I think our own human computer, which has our emotional um, qualities as well, have make a lot of sense to uh, you know, invest in. So if we would invest in the human potential instead of saying time is money, let's save a few hours of the human and instead have a machine, the machine is not going to do that sensitive touch, you know, that it just comes with employing any human instead of it who will have the common sense, which is actually not so common as we know. It's a very important sense, the human sense. And I feel that if you allow human resources to circulate proactively and engage human resources, surely you could reduce the expenditure of natural resources, but this is not the only advantage. There will be many more advantages uh, to this as we will see in the rest of the talk. But time is one of those human resources that I feel it has been a mistake to save and cut back on human time because we think it's it's more costly than a machine. but. If you take the true cost of anything, you'll see that investing in the human is the best thing we can do. And especially in the West, you have a kind of um, architectural um, or, or let's say construction habits at least, where we tend to give more importance to the machine remaining employed than the human. If the human is employed, you know, uh, you are often not able to let the human use the human intelligence because of the corporate common language. Like if you go to a Starbucks coffee, it, I'm going to get a standard coffee. That guy who's making the coffee, he probably worked in a small cafe and he would give exactly the user and the maker would make it very unique to suit each other's needs and it would cost a lot less. But similarly, uh, we have created a situation that even when we do employ the human, we are asking them to behave like a machine instead of allowing that human directness and the same guy can make hundreds of different coffees for the everyday customers but the, it is, the human performs much better when he doesn't have to perform as a machine. They like their job more even. So I would like this as a in order to solve the materiality, to improve the materiality and the consciousness that goes into it is the is um, let me reformulate this uh, sentence that I think if we invest in human resources we will evolve as humans because it is said that what we make makes us so in the course of building architecture we will build knowledge and we will build community and and build a widespread common sense like actually our ancestors already showed us what uh, it was possible to do. And, and time is an un underrated resource which we are freely spending uh, or, uh, or not spending properly, you know. And after all of this kind of uh, avoiding humans in, you know, as an economic strategy, do we have more time or are we less stressed? That's also not the case. So we have to really look at this, I feel. I started my journey leaving Bombay and traveling in the rural areas and to look and just started realizing, observing that how are building materials actually sourced and today I am of the opinion that it's the very beginning of how you source a material where you already have a territorial impact like uh, if a brick is made in a rice growing area because that's where the clay collects after the rains and built in this kind of brick kilns where the kilns are themselves 
a stack of bricks that have to be cooked. These bricks are stacked in the middle of a field. That, that stack becomes the oven. Then the mud is plastered and the, the firewood thinnings from trees which are planted by the people themselves during a time where agriculture doesn't need them in their process. So, you know, this same community are producing all of these things uh, rather than working eight hours in a brick company. So what happens is after the fire, after firing, all the brick kiln is dismantled and the whole place becomes a field. The overheads are different. The quality is different sometimes and we learned, uh, for example, this, uh, this brick here is one of those traditional bricks. When this is uncooked, but when it's cooked, it will be, we, we learned that uh, a fired brick is more, um, it's more reason, like, um, it's the, the industrial fired brick has much more straight edges and we were considered, we were taught to kind of look up to it as a good quality brick. Today I realize that this, whose quality may be about half, is a superior brick because first of all, it can carry the two-story load anyway. This is not the fault of the craftsmen who purposely made it crooked. It's not like that. They are casting it on a field with no infrastructure. So the back is rough, the front, the top is smooth, by, but you see the hand uh, thing in, uh, made in a mold. And this brick is for, the, for what you have locally with the clay, the, the, the fuel you have locally, this is the highest that this clay can go. And it's not bad to have that approach instead of saying, let each and every uh, brick, even if it's a ground floor structure, let's have the highest quality because it comes at an enormous price. The kiln in which you fire bricks, I've found out gradually all these details, is that it absorbs about 40% of the heat you generate, 980 degrees, half of it goes into the wall itself. In this case, yes, the walls are on the outer side, the bricks are a bit less fired. But we used to sell them as first quality brick, second quality, third quality. And the third quality is used in the interior walls. So it's fine. I think this approach, I started realizing and appreciating in all my travels that I made into all the building material manufacture and I realized there's such a circular way of building that there was, now we have this term circular economy. But actually the linear economy is the one which was introduced by the industrial practice. The other one is a timeless way of doing things. So I realized that whether it is brick kilns or lime kilns, I started noticing all materials, natural or man made or man made are in any case sourced from the earth all materials whether it's wood or it's stone or even cement it is sourced from raw materials from the earth so all materials come from the earth the broad group is either they are um, um, they, they can be used directly like stone or they have to be uh, made to undergo a manufacturing process with more energy to combine different materials to up the game of its uh, uh, characteristics. In that case, you have cement because you, or you take mud, you make it go through an oven and then you have brick. And then that brick will last now the, it's 3,800 years that we're using bricks and the old bricks have still the same quality. So that kind of building, you can assess it over a lifetime of the endless life of a brick as opposed to the short term materials. Um, like cement, concrete, etc., have much shorter time spans. So I realized that in my case, I had to go so deep into studying all these materials to find out where the answers lie and to know for myself. Uh, and that's why I talk a lot about building knowledge because I think knowledge is not a thing you can pass down. Unfortunately, if I write it in a book, it doesn't mean that knowledge is now in that book. It will only exist, knowledge only exists in the minds of the people. It will, its knowledge is not a physical thing. It is absorbed in our mind and there is a competence to do something with it. And if uh, any amount of books exist in a library, if somebody doesn't read it, they don't know it. So it's, uh, it's, it's a thing that I think we, we also owe our future generations that we've developed this knowledge. So in the first 
uh, few buildings uh, where I have tried to use local materials, literally locally, I have faced the frontiers of where it, it is either told to us that it will be too expensive to do it and um, and so on and then because these are again generalizations so I learned that you have to actually do the math to find out when it is more expensive and when it is actually even less expensive instead of just believing the myths that are circulated. So I started uh, pro material by material started going to the source and understanding how humans even in, in India where I practiced, they still hand extract rock from the from a mountain. I mean, it's not rock actually, the whole mountain, uh, white granite is, is the whole mountain, whereas dark granite is boulders, so that has to be sliced. So very different processes. When we go to a shop, you look white granite, gray granite, black granite, and you don't know the difference between them. So I started, uh, applying them in the contemporary spaces through engineering. I tried to use very little material and for example in this case I have created uh, a showroom kind of situation where the granite is self-supporting in granite chips which are also dry uh, by its own weight, you know, by leaning on each other. But I'm also trying to showcase the skills that I started realizing that uh, what uh, what human hands can do and uh, how much of a luxury element it gives to the space to know that human hands we were able to afford that they were engaged in the project so similarly i went into different material groups another area where i worked a lot is with terracotta because i in one of my very early projects i tried to build roofing systems with terracotta um, structures where such as this one I had encountered when I settled in Auroville in South India I noticed that around me there was uh, there were potters communities who were trying to sell cooking pots which you could see is not going to be sold in the future and they, they were still making them habitually and I, and you could see that urbanization is uh, threatening their livelihood. So I was wondering how, because there was a whole city to be built there, and I was looking at how can we create a palette of materials and building technologies, particularly roofs, because roofs uh, are the main problem of load bearing, and they, that's where all the high energy materials go in. So I. Uh, we managed to divert their skills. I thought urbanization could permanently give them a livelihood, a secure livelihood if we could divert the skills into production of housing. So we uh, used a catenary curve to have a load bearing situation where larger up to four meters in this case um, roofs that are insulating could uh, be carried without any supporting structure like terracotta in the past has been you know used uh, on top of a lot of uh, wood uh, substructures and in this case uh, you don't need any with that form so through each project that I did with any of these communities and that's what I mean by building communities so here is an example like this is a when I started out 1990 this was 1990, yes. Uh, you see, I'm dealing, you know, I'm, with, I'm still exploring and learning, but through the help of the craftsmen, as well as people on the site, and um, experts such as Ray Mika, a Californian ceramist who guided uh, all my work in terracotta, uh, and also produced some of the early materials for me to ensure high quality. I learned from the way they were making bricks to consider making things not in factories but in areas close to their homes and to fire them with coconut and whatever bio waste and still uh, ensure a good quality. So that community on one hand, the mason and other community on the other hand to have their support because um, in my early years the engineers were not uh, necessarily so supportive in this kind of radical ideas. And they would often also be discouraging and this can't be done and that can't be done. But usually craftsmen were very hands on and they were, would give actual solutions as to how to do it. So through that, 
um, several of my projects uh, have you know been the result of these type of enquiries but wall house which is a house I built for myself uh, 10 years after um, I think I moved there in 2000 um, and I used uh, my house budget to use this kind of handmade bricks to show off them to show them uh, exposed so that people can see what brick I'm using so I started creating uh, you know this kind of contemporary architecture with local materials so and with local skills and where there were no, no skills to cr create and develop skills and then produce uh, architecture out of it and by that time each thing you do empowers you to do the next thing so finally I was able to find an, a use for the cooking pots they used to still make which we usually buy during Pongal which is a annual fest in which rice is cooked in this bowl still and then I this I had an idea how to uh, use them to optimize reinforced cement concrete slabs so here is one image of that process where you can see it is being used as a lost form work to reduce the volume of concrete but also to reduce um, significantly the amount of steel that goes into a typical concrete slab so here you have two bars of steel saved out of every three because of these kind of curved forms and a larger effective depth these are called filler slabs uh, where you create voids to make concrete slabs efficient so even though most of these um, you will see a lot of people are now using terracotta uh, in that manner but a lot of the applications that you see are not necessarily performing in that engineering way and are often only decorative in my case it was done because I'm so not a nostalgic person about the past uh, habits that in my case it is always there is always an engineering advantage behind it so this is uh, these are the kind of experiments done in the wall house um, and also small rooms were uh, shade were covered with partly prefabricated uh, ferro cement kind of beams with jack arches made of these kind of hollow terracottas because those other roofs I showed you they are vaulted and that you cannot use the roof of that but if you need to use a terrace this is a solution for you to get insulation whereas the filler slab that I showed you is for intermediate slabs where you don't need any insulation so I started you know bringing it down to all of these combinations uh, so this is a the wall house for me was a lab for all of this research and you see a screen there with ferro cement um, that I'll show you in a while but here is the house that is made out of this there were several architecture projects where I used this kind of uh, building palette or building technology palette in this project you see the hut in which I first lived when I first came to Oroville from Bombay and so I, I did not have the means to obviously build a house for myself but a lot of people in that area were living very simple in temporary huts and of course mine is a bit of a designed version of that in the sense that uh, they are using round wood tied with rope and just granite slabs on the floor and uh, coconut thatch leaves so I myself also created, I had the luxury as a Bombay girl coming to a city girl coming to the middle of nowhere to have uh, this kind of a very nice experience to be directly living as natural as it can get you know there's also because it's a dry construction there's no carpentry involved just coconut rope is holding all of these uh, elements together fabric is used as a shutter the whole house can breathe uh, it's a dream for it was a dream for me to live like this and I thought this house would maybe stay just for, last for a year or two because I was just a fresh a young graduate and I saw people living like that and I started appreciating it more and more and actually by the way I lived here for 10 years and it could have gone on I realized that in this house that's what I realized time is a resource for example the whole house does not have to be replaced at one go every three years the thatch gets replaced every 
few years if the water if you didn't replace the thatch then the thinner round wooden members may get rotten or if it was a very old thing the termite the termites could have eaten it and even the termites i thought what happens because i didn't have any funds so i thought i won't treat anything termite proof and all that they are mostly poisonous and i wanted to see how long will a tiny termite actually sit and eat that wood and i realized it's it takes time you know i'm not now promoting to not use uh, termite proof uh, materials but i realized that so much in this house has to do with a reflection on how time is viewed for example a round wood uh, instead of using a timber section a rectangle section will take at least uh, 10 times the number of years to grow for making the same cross section from round to, to rectangle instead a, a three year old tree can be used here just you can harvest some part of the tree and the tree is going to still grow and and if you want to wait for it to become a rectangle it's going to be many many more years so already if you are ready to no, not have standard architecture drawings and build in that way i realized how much simpler it is to go uh, why this is so much more affordable and if you were to really think of tree as a renewable material then it may be worth considering the use of round wood again in which case you're talking about not making uh, mass production but allowing the carpenter to make some decisions and sometimes allow a piece of wood to be crooked and so on so this was a great learning for me and also it was a very beautiful space to be in i really enjoyed this time most of all i realized how important it was for me to take time to do nothing in the some for some hours of the day so that you have time to think and i realized that yeah this kind of experiences in your own life um to live in close contact to nature it has been a really really uh, deep uh, it has had a deep impact in my life and that's where my sustainability concerns came from it's from having directly recycled my water uh, uh, into the uh, uh, into the garden or having a bag uh, a black bag of water that was heating itself during the day and i could use it when i came back home for a hot bath and very simple direct ways uh, to 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 use common sense with very little resources to live lightly but to have a very nice designed space and it took 10 years for me to move out because most modern architectural things could not match those qualities and that that's the reason why i started exploring terracotta because i used to have architecture projects and i didn't want them to have a conventional house because i had experienced how my home was not uncomfortable climatically so i raised the bar for all my future architecture and here are some examples for other larger projects i did later on where i started using people's time as a resource in the construction uh, to uh, to allow that architecture in a co-housing can also be open to be produced by the residents to whichever extent they are willing to engage so for example rammed earth walls or uh, you know painting and uh, you know doing carpentry according to the skills that people have they were welcome to participate so in this co-housing we had actually received our first uh, recognition i would say we had received the architecture award of the year for housing for producing this kind of a project uh, in even for producing a co-housing i suppose at all where we said that the time of the residents is also a shared resource each one doesn't have to do their cooking and so on it's a very affordable project but they could have very small spaces larger rooms for themselves because the kitchen was common or rooms common for children or for yoga and multipurpose uses with streets on upper levels and all of those buildings that uh, elements that i had researched were applied in bigger and bigger projects from then on one interesting radically experimental project that i want to share is called uh, voluntariat homes for homeless children but the technique we used to uh, build this is called baked in situ earth houses i have coined this term baked in situ houses for um, mud houses that was developed by Ray Meeker whom i already mentioned he had pioneered the technique to build 
uh, mud houses and fire them in situ. Mud house, mud brick stuck with mud mortar and used as a kiln to bake other brick projects, uh, products uh, and ceramic products uh, because as I also told you that about 40% of the heat goes into the kiln as a waste and he thought that this fuel could be tapped to bake a house and there is widespread local knowledge about how to bake bricks in the region so perhaps radical as it is it could be lead to an affordable housing te technique later i did my phd in this topic so you see here it is a mud house mud bricks um, are stuck with mud mortar and you see there are some fired brick in the bottom courses there is a little holes from where oxygen can enter for combustion we have to create like a grill layer for oxygen to come in and then there are other holes which are like the fire boxes where we are going to feed uh, fuel and um, you know and later we are stacking this grill like space we, the, these are the product bricks mud bricks that are going to be fired inside the house so the whole building Theoretically, it can be seen that you are firing the products in a kiln, but the kiln is the architecture. Later, that kiln which is left behind will become the house. So, first the structure, architecture serves as a kiln to produce other materials and by tapping the heat that is coming out of there, we are cooking the pro product of the house. And this means, for me, uh, the, my PhD was to record all Ray Mika's experiments, but for me what is important is to see what a huge difference it makes if the fire is brought to a factory to make big ovens and chimneys and all the paraphernalia, or if you bring fire to the home to bake it. And that makes a huge socio-economic um, is socio-economically different impact when you can make the house a producer of building materials rather than a consumer. So this is what happens but after you finished firing the house you can sell the products or you can use the bricks to uh, finish other parts of the house but for me what is the most interesting thing is that even if it is a brick house for the price of a mud house also it's a brick house without using cement because fire is the cement. There's so many areas that are fascinating, including the fact that you can make the bricks of whatever size you want. This is a slide from Ray Mika's previous works where he has fired all kinds of things here. He has fired uh, ceramic tiles, wash basins, water spouts, gargoyles, uh, wash basins, furniture elements in terracotta, lanterns, all kinds of things which he could sell to recover the cost of a house. But uh, for me, what is also very interesting is while I, while I used to watch him do this, I was producing such as this pots, you know, this is the first, this is the first pot that Ray Meeker made for, for my architecture. He was keen to help me. In any case, he was helpful. This is the first wooden die to determine the shape. This was the rejected one and this is the selected one. This ones we managed to use in the house. Those ones he fired because he was always looking for ceramic products to fill inside his experimental fired homes. So through this association, I realized there are no boundaries between the material production and the final architectural production. And this is how the homes are finally finished by using a lot of waste material, waste broken tiles, etc. to finish the house with whatever we found and uh, and I will talk about one other element uh, of, of it very soon but uh, I'm just moving now to my ferro cement research so up till now I've been looking at uh, showing you the p potential architecture's potential to uh, reduce uh, the to build many more uh, square meters of architecture with this, uh, the same amount of material expenditure by investing in engineering. So not creating new materials but finding new ways to use timeless materials and there's a huge potential to optimize them. 
But on the other hand, I feel in the age of climate change, we have also been uh, looking at cement, cement, concrete and high energy materials that also need to be used to navigate the fact that there's going to be a lot of more wet areas and coastal areas, etc. Cement cannot be wished away. It allows us to produce high density and lower the urban sprawl and make cities pedestrian as a result, etc. But if we create a polarized thing that the sensitive architects are only looking at mud and bamboo and natural materials and ignoring the manufactured materials potential to save forests, etc. on a larger scale, then I think it's also an area of neglect. And so one of the things we've been doing is, uh, and I'll share only that project with you, is fer ferro cement. It involves the use of chicken mesh instead of uh, large diameter bars. So very fine chicken mesh, but also we are exploring other meshes and natural fiber, glass fiber, etc. Um, to uh, be placed in the middle of a two and a half centimeter element that is only one inch thick, it's about this much, and the steel is in the middle. So it's like two and a half centimeters is what a plaster thickness could look like. So you, even if you would have a brick wall and plaster it on two sides, you would be using more thickness of plaster than that. So we are using cement plaster, typically one side and reinforcing it with chicken mesh. And with this element, because it's so thin, we have to fold it and bend it and do things to the form to make the form strong uh, enough that it can be borne by only one inch uh, of a thickness. So one idea in this direction is a full fill home modular system that I have designed for also the surfaces of these cement finishes to be done in a kind of stucco kind of uh, soft finish of um, like you can find in tiles and wall surfaces but also to elevate the color experience a little because a lot of people who cannot afford homes otherwise they could do with the cheer that color brings. So it's a very attractive system which you can assemble in a day and all these elements can be also hand carried so that you can save energy and wherever required you can also just have four people carrying a piece and so on. So. Um, this, this is a very flexible system where we are also promoting the idea of allowing craftsmen to produce uh, these elements. They are small, narrow elements. You can see some of these modules even behind me actually here. This is, these are uh, like wall elements where you can actually store your clothes and your things. There are two different sizes for them. But each of the pieces are so small that it can be built anywhere in a balcony or in a uh, you know, you don't need to have factories. So we are trying to create decentralized uh, way of producing architecture and the engineer goes, checks quality and collects all of that so that we can save on all the ov overheads and people can get to work. They are empowered and housing is can be brought back to the people somehow and they can be empowered through the knowledge of producing it like handicraft, you know, at home. So. This is an, uh, the display of this in the Venice Architecture Biennale, a full-scale home. And next to it, a toilet sanitation unit with a shower cubicle and a toilet and a wash basin in the middle. And, you know, here we see in the last years, we've been trying to also test these in through German collaboration here with Mike Schleicher's laboratory with Professor Arndt Goldach in the photo here. We are doing load tests to show how the material is so ductile that it has higher seismic uh, probably properties than the, you know, like a typical concrete element would not have bent like this, it would have broken. So I think we, we, there's a lot of uh, uh, seismic uh, properties that could help use ferro cement in navigating climate change is my feeling. And uh, also, yeah, it's a very light material. Uh, uses very little of these energy materials. See, this is the bathroom unit. You see how it can, because it's so light, it can take such a big span. The roof slab is so wide and the, uh, you know, it, the, the shower cubicles can get air from that slope. So you don't need to have windows in it. So, yeah, that is uh, the another, it's called EZWC. That is a toilet um, unit. And um, 
the, the third is an application of uh, ferro cement in a cast in situ pro process application where larger halls and shelter units and roofs, very big um, spaces in, you know, it could go up to 8 or 10 meters, even normal public spaces and uh, multi-purpose halls in housing could be built using uh, the knowledge of origami crease patterns which help to make a simple uh, paper so rigid then you can imagine that it would this kind of a form would allow such a thin cement element to become also so rigid that you could span a whole roof you know there's no wall the shape is such that the wall roof everything is one and uh, it is so light that hopefully it can be um, produced in cast in three or four days um, in, and, and the form work could be this kind of Amazon recycled carton which you can fold and carry easily to the site. Also this chicken mesh could be carried and unfolded in a site. Such little steel that could go into producing shelter. It, this whole research was begun uh, for me, ferro cement's uh, applications for solving disaster relief because I had uh, been there during the tsunami in India and I saw that a lot of, uh, you know, time, again time is a resource. It doesn't mean we are just producing slow architecture and it's taking so long, it's not like that. It's a slow research process but when we have to build, uh, in four days you can produce all of these architectures that I have shown you. Uh, but it's the thing is if you when the tsunami happened, I saw a lot of people rushing about and finding solutions. And because we act in haste and when you're not prepared, we are wasting all those resources. I thought, let me work towards a series for, for future applications. But not only for disaster, I realized a lot of this architecture could be used also um, for shelter. And, you know, we've done a whole lot of experiments in this direction. But um, I'm going to sort of wrap this up now by uh, just showing you how my material research is so important for me. I want to dis demystify that concrete is just some grey thing we draw in parallel walls in architecture school or we always draw parallel walls and we don't know what's the materiality inside. So I have produced all these palettes of ingredients like a cooking table where you see everything that goes into it and you know the uh, you can visualize and when you don't understand normal materiality, how can we rethink materiality? So I've produced all of these uh, years of research in a very easy to digest way, which was shown in Louisiana in my solo show. And I just uh, want to end with a couple of examples of uh, urban waste is a material that I've confronted more when I'm in the West because I can't believe how much we are throwing away and what can be playfully done with it. Um, I'm just going to show examples without explaining too much. There is a series of investigation of how to dispose of paper, magazines, or, you know, all of this which is all being burnt and pulped. We can, you know, we've made furniture but also we've done uh, one playful uh, pavilion. Whenever we do buildings which are just for a couple of months, we are trying not to um, buy anything but just take something from the garbage. And in this case, we took uh, books from this on-site library next to the place where we had to build this pavilion called Library of Lost Books in Barcelona. So we vacuum packed them with the same thing they use in a household packing of ham and olives and all that. So we use that kind of vernacular technology to vacuum pack open books and make them rigid and we stitch them to make canopies and uh, to make the point you know that first of all about building knowledge and knowledge and books and that association but also you know you see the site you see the pattern on the floor and the same kind of uh, things sensitivities we apply for architecture belonging in a place that has been also used in the material and the benches are, uh, were carried by the shops next door, but these are all indeed made of paper from magazines. So that's how strong paper can be when you fold it. So these are the kind of, um, you know, things that I'm doing with urban waste, but also in the production of uh, volunteer, for example, and in all our projects, we are also using waste products 
for form work. We are using sometimes adjusting or if you find a rubber tire, you know, just increase the window or decrease the window a little bit so that you don't need to buy and waste money in form work. Like I said, I've done a lot of work in form work because concrete used to be very, very um, up until the 60s, it was done more adventurously. You had a lot of shell structures, you have the work of Candela and many people who were optimizing use of concrete, but the form work is very expensive. So my, my uh, Amazon carton form work actually helps us to um, make facets out of the shell. So the shell is not hard to cast. It's all paper, nothing is wasted because it's pressed into triangular uh, folds, you know. So all those things are how to make those uh, experiments of the 60s continue to happen again and to unblock the disconnection we've had in our generation. But here are some yeah, such applications with broken glass and if you go to buy uh, glass blocks from the factories, it's going to be very, very expensive. But you could use this, you know, which we've used uh, in the domes. So I'm trying to now also introduce as a professor the uh, thinking with the hands concept from which I benefited also into the architecture studio. I think uh, I, a lot of these workshops uh, that I do in, in a week or a day or a two, three day, you will find students from all schools uh, or where they invite me like Mexico, etc. You know, in two days we are putting up a terracotta wall. We filled it in this case with sand or water. So, so students get an, a real opportunity to handle materiality during their studios and in a two-day workshop you can handle like this you know four strategies they must confront real materials real scale real people and real places if it's very easy to do and it's not necessarily more expensive as it's often said and i think this is what i'm doing as a professor even if there is no need to build a structure even if you have a party and you have to distribute water bottles you can arrange it nicely first and then during the distribution, you spend it. But the, the students can get a chance to learn something which they will never forget through the fact that they have to erect a structure in one-to-one. -one. This is another denim experiment. So if you didn't think with your hands that you lose so much of our intelligence already there, which I want to include in the human resources uh, optimization. Um, I'm just going to show these images and uh, explain that how even in the Venice Architecture Biennale, when we reproduce something in full scale, there are areas where we, with our students, always there's something new to be done, such as this application with glass vault, uh, or for the fact that students, 10 students from Venice and 20 students from Australia could come and build a hole from foundation to the house uh, in a six week period uh, and learn all the architectural phases and not only the concept stage that is always done in the studios. You know, so these are real life processes and I try wherever I can to have uh, the next generation have the same or to create opportunities for them that I had not had in the studio period to teach them dry constructions, wet constructions, demystify cements and everything else. And now I'll just end with a few more images. So I started out with the three images of the large scale of, uh, you know, as a person who grew up in Bombay, I can never forget what kind of a pressure our population and our urbanization is placing on the planet. And so whatever I do, even if it's a small little hut somewhere, I think about it as a prototype and I think about what, how it could affect the big picture because actually my small details are affected by the big picture, you know. And so while I have been doing all this architecture, I was also involved in um, Auroville's city planning. I have uh, been fascinated by Roger Angers, the chief architect uh, of Auroville and the fact that Auroville was seen as the city the earth needs and Roger Angers had produced a, a very interesting concept for a radically rethought um, project, a, a, a urban idea 
where it's a car free city land cannot uh, be owned so we have to redefine how architecture and bylaws are defined if there are not pl plot boundaries land belongs to the commons so there are very very interesting um, aspects in Oroville but Oroville was actually grounded in South India uh, uh, and is, is managed by um, Oroville Foundation under the Ministry of Education. So the mission of Oroville was to advance, to, create, to achieve actual human unity through international uh, participation and uh, it was actually done keeping in mind that despite all our progress there's still war in the world and this is a very good time to talk about that and that's why Oroville was actually conceived and therefore the collective was um, the main was prioritized and the in we, we, we are aware that the individual that it is individualism actually that is not sustainable it's not just some uh, guidelines for sustainability we have to look at but also see what is the cost of individualism and this city plan was very fascinating for me and I had the opportunity to produce work on this uh, various stages of it but I also uh, um, Roger Angers uh, pedestrian plan had you know reached this kind of uh, expression um, and he had one of the most important things he had radically rethought was how to integrate skyscrapers and tall buildings into the urban fabric instead of dropping them like everywhere else and have no contact to the human scale etc. So um, I I worked on this for about 17 years and last year I was uh, appointed head of urban design for Oroville. I have, I'm authoring a book right now about Roger Angers visions for urbanism and I'm taking the time to explain it because this is his centenary year. So I would like to share all that I have learned from him uh, and not realizing how he mentored me uh, all these years because we were all so busy. I was running my own studio and doing some urban projects on the side. And uh, only later I see what a huge gift he has given me in terms of uh, having shared so much time and also that intergenerational um, contact. I think I have learned to also do the same and I hope that we don't lose the knowledge of the people before us so that we don't always start from ourselves to reinvent the wheel. It's too slow and too expensive. So Oroville now is a physical place, of course, on the, uh, on the earth, it's not a utopian city, it's more like a laboratory. And here in the foreground is a youth uh, center that I built. But uh, I would like to end now with this, that um, I'm uh, working on one of the structures more concretely, the tallest of these. Uh, it's a co-housing project with a mixed use um, that we are defining here. There are small clusters of 60 to 80 residents who in these tall uh, structures that slowly taper to the ground towards the gardens part. Um, they, they have shared facilities but they can have their own kind of quality and flavor. So we are an international community. There have to be so many choices of what kind of cuisine, what kind of habits people want and whom do they want to live with in smaller decentralized clusters is what I'm proposing here. It's called the line of goodwill. And um, I have been uh, working and involving as many people I can in the interdisciplinary consultation. This is the student project um, in Stuttgart where I was a guest professor. I had invited Jan Gale to come and uh, review it and also to give a lecture during it because uh, you know of his experience with pedestrianization. And I'm uh, similarly also inviting, I had invited student projects from Yale, from KDK and uh, Potsdam School of Architecture, which I have integrated inside the huge urban design to see what are the young people's visions and how do they want to see themselves living in the future. So one of the most important things is in this case, I would say to, for me, it's a common, I would like to end with that, the challenge for the future is how do we preserve human scale and intimacy in our environment with in the way we produce buildings, but also with the given bylaws to densify and go really high rise. I think it's an open question. 
but there are ways to keep the human scale experience in our own neighborhoods which is what i'm striving for and the other thing is to integrate nature and urban farming etc inside the facades and to be able to have uh, you know daylight into uh, our spaces and not to assume electricity to be running all our needs but realize that even if we could generate the energy it is not that we don't it's not going to make us feel well if we didn't um, solve our relationship with the outside so all these things could be radically rethought in the future landscape and the facades are a very important uh, aspect where the future of architecture research should go thank you Anupama, thanks so much for this truly inspiring presentation. Uh, I think what's so fascinating for me, there, there are a lot of topics uh, we can talk about now, but maybe the most fascinating thing is that the theoretical uh, material research and experimentation is really aiming at the change of direction in architecture but not in a, in a way that it's narrowing down everything like this is the way to go, this is the best material, this is the good material, this is the bad material. So I think it really gives a lot of food for thought for any architect and I think for a lot of architecture students that whatever you do you could should always trust in yourself and always look at the local situation look at the materials and not just search for some given industrial mater materials or natural materials or whatever mm -hmm. but you can always do better you can always uh, do more you can always be more innovative and and so it's such an an optimistic approach in 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 a time which is so kind of conflicted by so many crises we are experiencing at the moment so i think uh, your optimism is really spreading a lot of home and a second thing which is really uh, very moving for me even is that listening to you i have the feeling that you can uh, kind of divide the uh, practicing architects in two halves like the I think the bigger half uh, is this type of architects who don't have time to live, like you have the feeling they don't even have a sofa at home, so they're, they're, <laughs> they're just rushing out in and out of their office to some building sites, to some lectures, to teaching. So you have the feeling like they, they never oh. tried out how, what living means. And with your architecture, one can really feel that you took your time, like in your hut and at many other points, like experiencing what, what it means to be a human being on, st on the stage of our built environment. And I think this is really influencing or this is really, you, you can really sense it with your architecture and with your projects. And I think this is something that we completely lost and it reminded me so much of a discussion we have around food. And I think for most of the people it might be uh, more uh, easy to understand it if you're talking about food, like if you compare the agricultural industry with what we call local food, organic food, because it's so close to our body and it makes so much sense to all of us that the agricultural industry ha has had a very bad influence on, on our health during the last, uh, let's say, 50 or more years. But we don't really realize till now that the industrial built architecture is maybe having a very bad influence on our lives. Or Yeah. the, the I really appreciate, first of all, your comment about the optimism because I'm, and first of all, for both your comments, I like to say I'm glad you noticed <laughs> because sometimes I, you know, when we pursue something that looks like you're going against the current and when you're very young and you, have to, you see when you have many people think that first I'll just do whatever jobs and then pay my bills and one day I'll be in a position to think I don't think it works like that because you when you live that life, you create those tracks and it becomes harder and harder to do. And I think you have to do it right in the beginning, almost. Uh, because uh, if you allow fear to advise you, it makes you more, your fear grow, no, somehow. Uh, and I think somehow it is, it, it's a very lonely journey when you, the moment you take a step to do something differently, 
it's very, very sad actually that there are many people who come to discourage you. Because um, I have really faced a lot of that and I see many other people who are taking risks, who want to experiment, who are doing, who are enthusiastic, who are childlike, playfully like bonding to. And there's so much of uh, adult advice which is about con like tell them, hey, grow up. You don't do all that. This is this won't work. This won't work is a phrase that I so don't like to hear. Because I think those who think it won't work should just maybe shut up and say, okay, I don't know how to help you make it work. So let me watch with wonder you doing it. And can I help you somewhere to make it work? Would be so much nicer. But I I know that we don't get that. And that the very fact that you still do it, it indeed makes you grow up. So I feel that people who, t to all those who tell me, who have told me that it won't work and don't do this, you're wasting your time, um, why are you, you know, some people even are quite um, astonishingly harsh. They tell you you're doing it because you are just so, uh, arrogant, you think that uh, you can so at this age come and start some new thing. They, they, they misunderstand what you're trying to do and they don't even see your dedication. I wanted to, I want to thank you for noticing it because I feel that in that lonely space where you grow into being, it's so nice to hear that it is being recognized that behind all this is an uh, optimism. It's not uh, trying to be different for its own sake and all those things which you are told because that is very much there in the architecture. So I feel people project, you know, their thing. But I have tried very hard to encourage others around me who are experimenting or doing something, even not in only my field, but also craftsmen or if sometimes they say, if I had a little budget, I would like to try this out. I tell them, please take this budget, do it. or. It's okay, one, two of your labor days are wasted. Just do it, you know, and I, and the students. So I, I really believe in that because I think op optimism is one of the most important human resources. And I feel it's really, really important to actually do that. And secondly, I feel for your other question, you know, the second uh, comment about how we are producing architecture and you were classifying the two types of people. There is a myth that if we, we who don't question anything and keep doing the same thing, we are so busy as architects. We work day and night, we work round the clock, we are obsessed with our thing. I did not have that practice. People, those people think that if we take the time to think and redo, that we must be working twice as much. And we do, but it doesn't mean twice as much time. It means twice as much thought. And if you're, running about helter skelter then sometimes you are don't know what you're doing you know you're not focused and I as you can see my office is we are a small number of people but if you see how many things we have done over the years we have been present in our day and it's not always we are also leading hectic lives so I'm not trying to um, stand out from the normal culture I just feel that there is no Nothing can justify not being, taking the time to think before you act because it's not even, forget about the architecture you create, even if it's good, it's not healthy for the person who's not sleep, getting sleep day after day. It's going to be a very different meeting if they would be able to just. Absolutely. As you said in your lecture, not work like a machine. You know, we are not machines and, and the architecture business is very much influenced by machines. And, and yeah. I think <coughs> it's really getting in, into the, our bodies. We have an, a, a very small exhibition now in our gallery, uh, which is connecting very well to that a collective, a collective of very young architects, mm -hmm. so around in their 30s. So it's almost 60 of them that did a series of workshops and they created an exhibition with a very interesting title between cost estimates, breastfeeding uh -huh. uh, and building turnaround. 
And uh, of course, they are talking about a circular economy and not building anymore, working with the given and all these uh, contemporary topics. But they are also talking a lot about uh, what we call work-life balance. They said they don't want to work 60 or 80 hours a week. They just don't want to do it anymore. And, and they say the way we produce architecture is influencing the output, you know. So we really have to change our way of production. And it's really interesting when like the elder generation of architects is or some general audience is entering this exhibition, oh, these young guys with their work-life balance, yeah. they don't want to work anymore. But I think it's really important like that you have to care about yourself when you want to do a caring architecture, that this is uh, interconnected. Yes, I also myself, I have to say, I used to not have that kind of culture uh, to work beyond a certain number of hours because I do believe uh, we are part of a larger collective and there is uh, you need to have time to be with your grandparents and your children and the, everything because if you don't know if you have no time to be with people you you for whom are you building you do you even have contact your you know client group you know or the humans which so for me i also never believed that uh, good work is only because somebody's work so hard uh, doesn't it attract enough sympathy for me. I myself used to not want to be around employees, my own, if they are exhausted. Mm -hmm. I just don't enjoy it and I want them to go home normally and have a normal life and I believe that that shows our time management skills. The people who are not getting their work done in that time, I question their time management. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that if you just keep on working so many hours without food, sacrificing your food and whatever for me doesn't flatter me also, you know, mm -hmm. because it should be possible and uh, breastfeeding is important and it has to be done in the hours that it has to be done. So it's a good way to yeah. measure, I think. Yeah. Nice title. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, thanks. I also have two children. I know. And I know. so, yeah. and yeah. I have navigated all that. I have other interests. I used to, when I was in Auroville during this time, I used to go for dance classes. I used to do gardening. I used to do so many things. So we need to do all of those things. And another aspect, of course, uh, which is very important uh, with your practice is that you're con interconnecting uh, the ecological way of thinking and practice, uh, the way you are working with lightness or with um, natural materials, uh, with affordability. So it, mm. it's, n it's not either social or ecological, yeah. and it's not about boutique hotels out yeah. of rammed earth. So it's really yeah. about a very affordable architecture. And, and I really liked your expression saying, uh, the housing has to be brought back to the people. Oh. Or as a way that people as a, you know that it's not like I have to earn a lot of money first and then I buy my housing. So, but asking yourself, what could I contribute to my housing? And exactly. I think in, in the West it has become really difficult. I think to because with all our regulations uh, to introduce a kind of self-building. But I think self-building is important for. But you uh, see, your regulations. Your I'm glad you brought up this regulation. Mm. So the way I, if we want to genuinely solve the problem, what I tell my Western students or you know this kind of um, community is that really we need to realize if you are serious and adult and you are living in this world we need to know step back and look at what humanity we are all homo, homo sapiens and we are one species it's not like this is absolute then in the west it has to be like that or it's absolute then in India, to, then you have colonized, then that is introduced, then this is introduced there. So just like all the food of everywhere is possible here, other ideas are also coming in because again, it's not absolute that a one region of the world has to run with one set of laws because actually there are, I tell the students, there are universal laws and then there are man-made laws. Please take a moment to know the difference because the universal laws, let's say gravity, let's talk about climate, sun paths, these are not th things that no matter how much you design, you can affect them. Mm. So why don't you surrender to the natural laws after knowing them and question all the man-made laws. Every law that is, which we are, whenever they say, oh, this can't be done because of this law, 
I tell them, is it a universal law? Is it a man-made law? If it is a universal law, absolutely, we have to surrender. If it's a man-made law, absolutely don't surrender. Because if your own law has created a problem, yeah. that means like they say in this song, that you are prisoners of your own device. So please, I have no pity for that. Because it's not like a tsunami that some natural calamity happened to you. No, it's your, if our own stupidities or let's say our own short term thinking made us make some laws which are not good for us, we need to change them. And there are many good examples. I tell my students, look, how in Copenhagen the bicycle is allowed to come. New laws have been made, right, to enable that they get the car space back or that smoking is no more. Or Everybody thought it was unthinkable. All those people who are talking about this eco movement for building, they were saying the same for the food. They were saying organic 30 years ago here in Berlin. They were saying that, oh, you eco people, look how you look when you're eating this vegan stuff or the green. You know, there was all the deriding. And they were saying it will never, there is an industry, you will never make food produce in another way. But look, it's reversed. It's not such a big difference to today to pay for. Uh, you know, these are excuses, I think. And I think, first of all, for the clarity of mind, we have to know which of these uh, inefficient or not working situation, which of the problem is being created by us. Such as economic problem is just a way we manage it. There's a difference if a famine happens because it didn't rain or there is no food because of bad management. So we have to change it and at least allow people to question those laws which don't work. And second point in this is, you know, in the Western education, and it has also come through colonization to the other parts of the world, it's all about going into Neufert and all, you know, these time saver standards. The standards are for shortcut, you know, it's good. Standards have to be there. But if you forget the first principles, you must then you cannot change because you don't know anything about anything. You just took somebody, some human wrote that and you are still doing it because you've given it the same place as the gravity. It's not fixed in stone. Every day, if you have knowledge, we should make and uh, new laws. And by the way, the modern materials, there's so many every day there are new plastics, new steels, new this and that which are entering the market. They have fulfilled the codes. So if you want your earth block to fulfill, uh, somebody has to do the work and do the math, give the numbers, make it be in the code. Mm. It's just some work to be done and we have to do Absolutely, that work. Absolutely, yeah. And again for that you need knowledge and some courage. I would like to follow up this question of standardization, which is also so culturally specific, mm. uh, as you said, like we can, we can change it. and. And uh, if you look at the Green Deal in Europe, it's mm -hmm. all about standardization, a different way of standardization. We need an, an de taxonometry and all these laws. And I think there will be even less space for experimentation. And the question of, of lobbying and of in, involving into such processes, I think this will become really important. And I'm not sure that any student is learning that at university. Yeah, it is yeah. a bit worrying because I do believe uh, in widespread intelligence in, is equally in all human beings, just like every species. Can you look at a snake community and say these two snakes should tell all the snakes what to do? I mean, it's so ridiculous. Let's face it. Every, every bee has the same capacity to work for his hive as another bee. And I do believe that about humans. I really believe that. I just feel that some of them are giving in to intimidation and certain practices. It's another kind of colonization to allow the big sharks to always uh, make. And so we become very full of apathy and just submissive. And we are accepting a lot of laws and habits unnecessary because it is a question of domination. And the more you accept it, the more you will not develop the capacity to have a widespread uh, awareness. And I think that's why I believe the most important navigator is human consciousness and now there will be more uh, artificial intelligence and there will be so many other developments and standardization. These are all economic drivers and if all of these forces they will take a life of its own, they've already taken a life of its own and it's the human consciousness which is actually widespread. If we don't allow it to equally circulate everywhere, 
then we will really have a, a dangerous situation going forward when there is a real crisis you know humans will feel like oh i don't know what to do like each and every curtain i cannot if i have to go to a button and i'm not allowed even to uh, to just regulate my window i have to phone some customer service in some other country who will decide the temperature of my room okay and when there are problems you see what a big problem that does so the question is these are being done uh, it is a question of what we are allowing it's a very serious question actually i think Absolutely. and that's why human consciousness is such a precious thing and yeah and, and that brings me back to your concept of time uh, which is very central to, uh, to your work at the moment or not only at the moment has been central for for a long mm. time uh, and the question of human resources mm. you know if you look at demography uh, in in the west uh, in europe or in the us for example uh, they say we don't have enough workforce anymore in the next decades because exactly. the dem demography is going down and we have the fortress Europe. We don't want migrations or at least uh, the right wing populists and many of the conservatives don't want uh, migration. Maybe, I don't know, most of the, pe most of the population But who are, will do their work? Who will do their work? And, and the question of human resources, that human resource resources are not there anymore. So I think there will be a huge gap of human resources between that so-called global south and global north. Like how, how does this yeah. affect what you think about or what you imagine about uh, integrating, hum reintegrating see, human resources? See, the way I see it is I think all of these things are self-regulating. You know, there is a larger, I believe in the larger collective who self-regulates. When it gets too much, there's a protest. When it's something happens, when it's too much of something, it tries to balance. But we don't know what can be tipped in which direction. That's why everything is precarious. But I, my, I was very struck when my children had asked me earlier, because I live in both sides of the world, so I see it from this perspective. And when I go there, I see it from the other side, who have another view of things. They asked me, when they were much younger, that, mommy, how come all these uh, deliveries of food are always brown people? Because we never get to see them in the everyday life, but only when food is being taken here and there on a cycle. So I was like a bit moved by the question. But also of late, I've noticed here that a lot of brown people are entering suddenly because in Berlin, there is a lot of digital companies, etc., being set up. And that is also a truth. You know, there are certain works that the society was doesn't want to do, but they want to rely on. So somewhere it will equalize all of this and it will affect the economy. These some of the slow processes of Europe and of their ch ways of changing uh, laws and all that, they are so slow. I mean, a lot of the farewell to and a whole administration cost, it's so costly and it's all being done for its own sake. It's forgotten for what was it. Half of the funds of uh, something goes into its own management. All of this will all show up no, in the economy when other places are cheaper to produce things. So we will see. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm very optimistic in this self-regulation things because who do we think we are, you know? You can control and then suddenly something happens. Look, there was COVID, then there's something, everybody gets humbled. We are not so relevant only from our perspective. Absolutely agree with that, but I would like to have some of your optimism, actually. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, last question, I think the question of prototyping is also very interesting in your work because more or less each project is a prototype yeah. for something. And of course, yes. the question comes in, in my mind, like prototyping always is like a start of a series. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. uh, but the series are not really there so far. So is this like, um, is this a drama? Or is it just like that everyone can look at these prototypes and use them and get some inspiration for them? You know, or, a lot of the prototypes yeah. that I started doing, mm? I always do it as a prototype because as I said, I'm always into the big picture and I don't like to do a small thing because everything I research I always think what else can it be applied for mm -hmm. because otherwise architecture is an architectural research is so expensive you know and it's so difficult so I feel like when you're putting in so much effort it's good to th it's a way maybe to fool myself or justify that it's for a larger cause so go go and think of that but anyway it's 
in certain things like these some some of the ter terracotta thing i see many of them in other people's works as well uh, and in fact sadly i sometimes even see it in other people's work done up to 10 years later and people think that i have been inspired by them uh, or etc or copied or whatever but you know it's always flattering when you see the thing being used or being found useful mm -hmm. So some things have been applied and some of them are not applied but I don't feel discouraged because actually when you do a prototype it's very exciting because that's where the actual frontier of your knowledge is because you are working to build to materialize something from a drawing to materializing all the engineers everybody's involved the craftsmen it's a very it's like the main scene the performance after practicing the rehearsal you know so it's very exciting it's not at all frustrating if I never I don't have such a big feeling of, you know, oh, for how frustrating nobody has uh, taken and mass produced this. I don't mind. It had one home to be done and it was used there. It is a good system. If someone comes forward, I'll do it. I do what I can and I don't feel as a person frustrated when it didn't happen at all. The only part I feel which is not so glamorous about the prototype approach is that it's very difficult for me to find money and resources and that's why we are frankly speaking, often um, struggling with how to keep this kind of practice mm -hmm. afloat. But I feel in the end of the day, I've had a fulfilling life and even while you struggle or have challenges, I think that is what also makes you feel alive. So I don't have regrets about it or maybe it would be great because I'm also open to collaboration. I think I'm happy to, I see myself as one element of society and I don't feel I never felt I have to do everything myself I feel even at home if the partner or the others are not helping I don't feel like now I have to solve everything myself I, I believe in do your best and forget the rest <laughs> seriously what else can I do I don't want to now suffer that to have such high aims that you're always falling short mm -hmm. I don't feel that uh, you know I don't have that kind of ambition and things like I do I do I enjoy that I'm thinking about concerns that when I'm looking at problems I think okay I've identified the problems and I'm taking it home and working on it but it's not just my job to solve all the world's problems obviously not so I do what I can up to where it's enjoyable and then I stop thank you so much Anupama let's stop with this invitation to join this endeavor and thank to you be part of the network Thank you, Anupama. Thank you, thank you so much. It was really uh, uh, very interesting to be with all of you and hope we can connect on other forum to take questions, maybe, I don't know, Instagram or other social media. Mm. Since we are not meeting all of you listeners, we are still open to talk to you too. Thank you. Mm.